So I want to thank uh, Colin and the uh, Berkman Center for the opportunity to uh, participate in this, this, in this conversation. Uh, occasionally at the uh, Kennedy School, you have the, um, the opportunity to engage in what I think of as conversations with the future. And I think this is one of those moments, uh, and I'm grateful for it. Um, uh, it's also an extraordinary moment. Um, and uh, my friend Tom Hayden used to say, change is slow except when it's fast. Uh, and uh, we're in a fast moment right now. And so you can't avoid thinking that choices made, directions taken, uh, have consequence uh, in ways that uh, for many periods of time they don't. Uh, things are in flux. Uh, things are at crossroads of different kinds, and so choices we make and actions that we take have unusual significance, I think. Um, now, uh, Colin said earlier that those of us up here, we were supposed to provoke you, so I'm going to try to do that, uh, at least a little bit. Um, the place I want to start is I want to talk a little bit about what organizing is about and about what uh, collective action and uh, uh, mobilization is about. Um, and um, as sort of an effort to kind of frame uh, one way to approach this question of internet and politics that we're going to be looking at, um, and um, uh, Jeremy is going to talk specifically about the relationship of organizing and new media in the context of the Obama campaign. Uh, and so uh, I'm sort of starting off with, with, with the groundwork on what's the organizing piece of that. Um, I think one of the most insightful things that uh, de Tocqueville wrote when he came here in the 1830s about to study American democracy was He's, he, one of the things he wrote was, uh, in a democracy, he said, knowledge of how to combine is the mother of all forms of knowledge. On it depends all others. It's interesting, because he didn't talk about the, um, the significance of individual liberty, which is certainly one way we think about democracy. But he talked about the creation of collective capacity. Because he was very concerned about the isolated individual confronting an all-powerful state based on his experience in France. And he was interested in combination not simply as a process of aggregating individual preferences, but a process of transformation, of transforming individual preferences into common interests, into common concerns, and into common focus, because that's what he felt was at risk, were the broad common interests that link communities and link people across, uh, across domains. Uh, not just the linking, the transformational linking of individuals one to the other, uh, in terms of common interests, but also resources, the capacity to act on those interests. So both the, the, the ability to conceive them and the ability to act on them, he linked to the process of combination as a transformational exercise, not simply a matter of aggregation. And uh, that form of organization uh, indeed then shapes American politics for much of our history, often in the form of civic associations uh, and more particularly social movements and other forms of, of organization. Ways in which people could discern common interests and mobilize common resources on behalf of those interests. So what I want to talk about is sort of what some of the core elements of that are. Uh, there's sort of three, I guess there's, there's three ways I think of what goes on in order to create that kind of uh, purposeful collective action. First is leadership. Um, uh, leadership as the practices that enable others to achieve purpose in the face of uncertainty. And uh, there's, there's, each of those words is important. Uncertainty is what demands leadership of us. It uh, demands an adaptive response, not just a routine. Uh, shared purpose is what creates the, the, the capacity uh, to achieve it. And the focus on others is my understanding of what leadership is all about. It's about creating collective capacity. Uh, and I'm not just talking about brilliance of personality. I'm talking about practices that enable groups to work effectively to achieve their purposes. Um, secondly, is building community around uh, leadership. Uh, and by community, I mean a bounded, stable um, uh, 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 entity capable of exercising agency. Okay, so I'm, I'm speaking very specifically about collective agency. And thirdly, power. In other words, a community that then is able to use its resources purposefully to create the capacity it needs to achieve its purposes. So leadership, community, power. Now, um, 
And I, and I have to say that I think the, the Obama campaign, which Jeremy's going to talk more about, probably uh, invested, probably made the greatest investment in the development of this kind of civic capital, which uh, to steal from Bob Putnam, I talk, uh, of civic infrastructure in terms of uh, leadership teams, trained organizers, and actual capacity on the ground uh, to uh, 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 turn these uh, wishes into, uh, into reality. An enormous investment um, that was made there. Now, I just want to touch on a few of what I think some of the key factors are. Uh, the first uh, in enabling this sort of process to happen. Uh, the first is uh, shared values. Uh, the significance of values as uh, organizing core, especially in the case of social movements, and certainly was the case in this campaign. Values are broader than interests. Values are communicated and experienced emotionally. And values are the sources of motivation for action. Uh, in other words, if you ask, where do you get courage, where do you get hope, where do you experience empathy, that's how values are experienced and made real. Uh, so there's an empathetic capacity that's essential for the communication, celebration, and realization of values. Uh, in particular, uh, narrative as a form of values expression, which is all about choices, individual or collective choices, and about ways in which people access uh, courage or hope uh, in order to be able to act upon them. So that's, that's number one it, as, as, a, as a condition. And of course, the, 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 this campaign was rich in that language and rich in that practice uh, from top to bottom. Second, um, shared interests. So number one, shared values. Second, shared interests. Now by shared interests, I mean interests based on relational understanding. Uh, in the organizing world, one of the first things you learn is how to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And the purpose of a one-on-one -on -one meeting is to discern common interests. It's to learn about another person enough that you can discern, is there a common foundation here? Is there a basis here to act together uh, purposefully? Uh, and are there resources to uh, uh, there? And are we ready to commit to one another to achieve that? And I emphasize commit because that's what takes it beyond aggregation. What takes it beyond aggregation is I commit to work with you, you commit to work with me, and the kind of peer commitments that, uh, that create organizational uh, capacity. Third, shared structure. Um, organization occurs through structure. And structure, although certainly my generation had issues with it uh, and uh, you know, perceived structure as oppressive, but one of my favorite pieces is Joe Freeman's piece, The Tyranny of Structurelessness, in which she makes the argument that if structure is not visible, it is nevertheless invisible and just hides dominance uh, patterns uh, that are much better acknowledged and put up front and, and dealt with. And uh, so structure is what creates the space within which stable interaction can occur, creativity can occur, um, uh, decisions can be made, and so forth. Um, it involves uh, the identification of common purpose, uh, of shared norms, uh, and of clear roles and responsibilities. Now, um, again, in the Obama campaign, uh, the structure behind the movement was critical. Uh, 2,500 organizers, um, it wasn't just like thousands of leadership teams popping up out of the earth spontaneously. Uh, these were uh, organizers trained, who in turn trained leaders, who in turn coached those leaders, and created a structure through which people could work together with one another productively. And it had to be learned, because a lot of the sources of teaching that uh, have fallen out of our culture. It's something our big civic associations used to do, haven't done for years, and so when people come together, they automatically, very often their group efforts uh, dissolve in frustration uh, and in failure and in people being pissed off at one another. You know what I'm talking about. I, you said I could use humor, so well, anyway, that was an attempt. Uh, <laughs> no, we all have awful group experiences, and the thing is that they're not necessary. They can be designed so that they don't happen, and there was a real effort in this campaign uh, to do that. Uh, fourth, shared strategy. Um, the work of figuring out how to turn what you have into what you need to get what you want. 
And it's not a one-time deal where somebody sets a strategy and then everybody implements it. Strategy, as you know, is adaptive. It's an adaptive art. It means learning in real time from new information and adapting your tactics and patterns of behavior to accommodate that information, nevertheless to pursue a clear uh, goal and objective. That's the purposeful part, and often it's the most creative part of organizing. And so certainly in this campaign, there was a clear strategic object objective, elect Obama president, okay? So, but there was a lot of innovation and adaptation of strategy in the course of that, and there was a structure and a place and a mechanism through which that work could be done. Um, and uh, finally, uh, shared action. Um, the ability to mobilize and deploy resources in the real world, not just talk about it, think about it, uh, speculate about it, but actually do it. And by resources, I mean money, I mean time, I mean effort and energy. And the deployment, meaning drawing individual resources together into a common purpose, and I'm sorry, the mobilization, drawing resor individual resources together uh, that can be devoted to a common purpose, and their deployment uh, was, of course, uh, is one of the key uh, things in any organization or social movement. Um, just creating voice, that's one way. In other words, say we want to uh, mobilize people who feel a certain way and they all it all turns into letters to somebody. That's great. That's an expression of voice. But the mobilization, the deployment of resources goes far beyond that in terms of what's required to actually uh, make change and make your uh, influence felt. Uh, just one little example are the, uh, the, um, uh, the people in the... Um, uh, window is it the window plant in Chicago uh, who are sitting in over there uh, because Bank of America cut off the credit of the company and so then the company shut down and so then everything was problematic and so here's a group that was able to act collectively using their resources not just to protest but to to stimulate uh, a mobilization around them with a, in a very specific and focused way coming up with that strategy being able to count on the commitment necessary and being able to actually translate it into action and then make the most of that action requires an enormous amount of focus. Of course, in a campaign, uh, you either contact voters or you don't. Uh, they either vote or they don't. Uh, the outcomes are clear and explicit and therefore possible to learn from. And so that's my final condition here is action that is clear, specific, intentional, and that can be learned from. So. Uh, value, shared values, shared interests, shared structures, shared strategy, and shared action, in my perspective, are conditions uh, for the creation of effective collective action. Um, and the question, I think, that, that needs to be addressed is to what extent and how and in what ways can the new technology uh, support this kind of activity, help it, uh, enhance it, uh, ways in which it may detract from it, uh, or whatever. And I sort of want to close with just, um, just one distinction. I think it's very important to appreciate the distinction between carpenters and tools. Uh, and that uh, the best tools in the world do not build a house. It takes a carpenter. Uh, and um, the emphasis in this campaign on investing in the development of skilled carpenters, that is people who knew how to use tools, because they had a clear purpose they were trying to achieve is what enabled the tools to be used in such a powerful and effective way. And I think the distinction between what's agency and what are, con and what are tools is a critical one to sustain, and I hope that's something that we can explore uh, in the time that we have here together. Thanks. Yes, sir.